Welcome to CMO Confidential, the podcast that takes you inside the drama, decisions, and choices that go with being the head of marketing. Hosted by five-time CMO, Mike Linton. Welcome, marketers, advertisers, and those who love them, the Chief Marketing Officer Confidential. CMO Confidential is a program that takes you inside the drama, the decisions, and the politics that go with being the head of marketing at any company it what is one of the most scrutinized jobs in the executive suite. I'm Mike Linton, the former chief marketing officer of Best Buy, eBay, Farmers Insurance, and Ancestry.com, here today with my guest, Dr. Dan McCarthy. Today's topic, the case for customer lifetime value. Why is this such a hard concept? Now, Dan is perfect to talk about this. He's an assistant marketing professor at the Gazette Business School, at Emory University, where he's been there for a little over seven years. He built a predictive analytics firm called Zodiac, which he sold to Nike in 2018. And he also founded Theta Equity Partners. Now, Dan's specialty, and you probably want to write this down, is the application of statistical methodology to contemporary marketing problems. And he has created what I think is the first customer lifetime value business school class Welcome, Dan. Yeah, it's great to be. Uh, it's great to be with you. Really excited to talk all things CLV and and how it connects with uh, with everything else. We are too. Before we get into that, though, um, let's let's w- give us a quick overview of what you are seeing in marketing in the wild with everything going on, uh, AI, big data, the pace of change. You know, recession, not a recession, coming off the pandemic. How's the how's the profession? trending in your mind? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, marketing has taken its knocks. So certainly budgets are tight. Um, you know, if you're a vendor, uh, all those discretionary projects that would be very interesting to pursue. You know, I think a lot of companies are taking a much sharper eye to those projects. And uh, and this actually speaks to, um, you know, what we'll talk about a little bit later, but, you know, there's this issue of marketing accountability and yeah. um, and how oftentimes the CMO role can be something of a revolving door, and um, that the the marketers can often be blamed and be the first ones to, you know, experience layoffs when when times get tough because you know, historically they've had a tough time being able to justify the value that they create. And so, um, yes, I know, yeah, it's all going to be it, it's well trodden territory for you, but uh, yeah, you know, certainly as we're having these. Uh, you know, kind of uneven times. Some businesses are doing great. And so, you know, they're not experiencing any of it, but others are having a really tough time. And um, yeah, I think a lot of the, you know, the, the first people to get cut, you know, a bunch of them are within the marketing department. So um, yeah, so it's kind of a, a weird, it's just a, a weird environment, very polarized. You know, oh, very and we are definitely hearing that. We're hearing also from a, a lot of B2B people about budgets being cut and the rush for acquisition suddenly, a, a, a 180 degree turn to okay now it's profitable growth and uh with a lot less money and that that is putting a huge amount of pressure on a lot of folks so so uh, you know and if particularly if you don't have data or you don't have math so so with that as, as a little background though and i agree with your assessment of of the marketing universe right now give us an overview of customer lifetime value and, and why don't you really teach in this course? Because a lot of people talk about it. I'm not sure everybody really actually knows about it or the real application. Yeah, we we kind of run the gamut. So it's not a pure models course, uh, but it's certainly it's not a pure course for the poets. Uh, we we kind of touch on both the the strategy, the philosophy, and some of the modeling. So um, so. It, it is Give the, us the uh, cliff notes of that, the strategy, the philosophy, and the modeling, so mm-hmm. people know the building blocks of, of the story. Yeah, I think, you know, and this actually, this kind of mimics when we think about um, successfully implementing and making money off of CLV. Uh, you know, that's really what companies are looking to do. They want to, to grow shareholder value. And if they can't do that, they're not going to pursue it. Um, and step number one, oftentimes, is getting cultural alignment, you know, that you have kind of buy in from people. Uh, higher up in the organization because you can have all the greatest ideas in the world, but you know, if you can't get your boss and your boss's boss to buy into them, um, 
yeah, it's going to be pretty tough sledding. You may not have the budget. You may not have the support you need to actually implement. So, so we'll talk about uh, kind of customer centricity, you know, as, you know, Pete Fader uh, defines it uh, at the very beginning of the course. And that's really to help just lay the groundwork. Like, why are we even doing all of this? You know, why do we care about retention modeling? Well, you know, there's a lot of value that can be made, uh, generated by looking at the world through the customer lens and specifically, you know, through the lens of, of customer valuation and customers are really different in their profit in terms of the profit potential that they can generate for a firm, very different in terms of what they care about. And, uh, and just leveraging that can create, you know, all these new opportunities that wouldn't have been there if you were just looking at the world through the lens of product. So, yeah, so we'll spend a bit of time with that right at the front. And then- And, um, and just so everybody knows, and make sure I'm getting this right, Dan, this customer lifetime value says it's the value of all your future customer sales and then how you can actually adjust that by improving loyalty or better customer feed. But it's really using the, the customer as the building block to your long-term financials. Is that is that a fair Cliff Notes journeyman summary of this? Yeah, for, for what CLV is and how it could be leveraged, yeah. uh, pretty much. And that actually is a great segue into kind of the second part of the, uh, the course, which is how do we even define the damn thing? <laughs> so you, know, you ask 10 people, what is customer lifetime value in terms of numbers? And, uh, and you might get 10 different answers. And so, yeah, so step number two is to say, okay, let, let's create a formula. Imagine that we had these customers and we could see their entire lifetime. We could see the profit, we can see the, the revenue, we can see the acquisition cost. We had all that data. We should then be able to agree on what the customer's lifetime value was, you know? And right. so, but yeah, I, th I think, you know, because there is that confusion, it really merits, a, I, I devote a whole class just to the definition of CLV and then to, you know, kind of other related terms that are very similar and relevant and valuable in other ways, but you know, maybe you're not not quite the same thing. And so, um, so I'll spend a lecture just on those definitions. It's not about revenue; it's about profit. Specifically, it's about incremental profit or marginal profit. Um, how do we think about customer acquisition costs? I'll spend a whole lecture just on the definition of customer acquisition cost and. I'll often say I could spend a whole course. Which sounds on. like it's really easy, but it is never easy. And and, uh, and it's not, it's very complicated. So yeah, you think it, it should be easier because in theory, it already happened, right? You spent the money to acquire the customers. They came in the door. You're looking backwards. It, it should just be an accounting exercise. Um, whereas, you know, CLV, we're making this projection into the future. You know, the future is uncertain. We don't know what's going to happen there. Uh, but I think in some ways, you know, predicting the net present value of profit into the future, uh, in some ways it's easier <laughs> because of all the attribution, incrementality questions that inevitably crop up when you start really uh, peeling back the layers of the onion on CAC. So so I spent a lecture on that and the time, you know, I wish I had at least a couple. Um, but yeah, I think once the definitions are in place for all these key measures like CAC, contribution margin, uh, CLV, how we do, how we think about some of the bookkeeping, then we start moving into the modeling. And I think there, you know, we're, we're, in, we're in a position, we know what we're shooting for. Uh, now, how do we start making these predictions that we need? And, um, and that's where we'll start going into retention modeling. And then we go into how we think about spend, repeat purchase and non-subscription settings, and then kind of rolling it all up into, into customer lifetime value estimates. So that, that sounds like a super class. Um, what, I've done this a couple of times, or at least tried to do it. And one of the biggest arguments are the multipliers you put in for some lifetime value and the assumptions you start making about future changes to the product or the pricing or anything else, where mm -hmm. one or two model variants can blow up the number one way or the other. Is is that is that happen a lot? And and how do you teach around like arguing about those variables and picking them? Yeah, I mean, I, I I'm a statistician by training. My PhD is in statistics. It's not even in marketing. And uh, yeah, I, I treat I treat it as 
as any other prediction problem that we want to, you know, to your point, we want to make sure that the model predicts well. And um, if you think about the CLV formula, right off the bat, you have to be a little worried if you are using a formula, um, yeah. you're probably not getting good predictions. But you know, because CLV is a prediction, we can see how well we predict. And if we you know, pretended like we didn't have the last year's worth of data, we could take all the data before that and see, all right, well, how well would my model have done in predicting right, this year? backwards, yeah. Yeah, and I think that that's a great litmus test, especially if you have some of the events that you're talking about, you know, price pricing changes and things like that. Um, it allows you to really stress test how good your model is, or, um, you know, maybe it gives good predictions, but there's some inevitable uncertainty or error. You know, what's my, you know, my 95% confidence interval? So yeah. Yeah, now we can start, you know, making sure that this is the model that we can trust instead of, you know, plugging some numbers into a formula. And when you, once you have your model when in this class, how often are you adjusting the model? Is it a constant organic kind of adjustment or is it a point in time reference kind of thing or is it a combination? Uh, so we'll, in class, we will do some modeling across cohorts. And so, yeah, imagine that you're working, you know, you're, you're the CMO of Best Buy or Ancestry.com. You have all these customers that are being acquired at different points in time. Right. And in theory, you want to have retention models or retention curves for every single one of those cohorts. So as those new customers come in, you kind of want to do something about them, you know? And um, and so we, we call that cross cohort modeling. And so we'll have a lecture or two just on you know, how we move from taking this one shot cohort to, all right, let's see what statements we can make about the entire customer base, you know, where we're kind of thinking about it in a cohort by cohort way. Um, so yeah, if, if we were doing this in practice, you probably would want to, rerun the model periodically. Um, yep. But as new data comes in, you're going to probably want to take your old model, run the new data through it. And that probably should be happening on a more regular basis because um, you know, the data, new data is coming in every day. That speed. <laughs> hey, so Dan, what prompted you to go down this path, create this course, do this, you know, customer lifetime value thing? I mean, what, what, what what drove this whole, I'm going to do this thing? Psychosis. <laughs> I had too much coffee. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's a good question because I had, when I first came to Emory, I taught a course on plain old marketing research, you know, yeah. survey design, non-response, conjoint factor analysis, you know, some of the usual kind of nuts and bolts uh, of you know, traditional a marketing research course and uh, and it was going great and the the course evaluations were really good you know I, I won a couple of teaching awards for it um but you know my my research it's all about clv and my you know all of this the work that i'm doing in industry it's also all about clv so again i i like those concepts and the, the marketing research concepts but i jump out of bed to talk about the clv stuff and um so it's just fun. Yeah. So I, I thought, you know, first there is this real gap in the MBA curriculum where we just, we don't have this. The closest thing that we'll often have is a, like a CRM course. Right. You know, and this is very much not, and you can hear from this description of the class. It's just very much not that. Um, well, CRM is, it just sits on top of stuff like this and optimizes it, or at least that's, that would be my take, but it doesn't actually do it um like this so yeah so so I, so you create this class and, and let's just move on I, I want to talk about how come business schools are not like absorbing classes like this and big data and other stuff at speed um because that is what's happening in the marketplace is mm -hmm. all this stuff is crashing into the cmo space and CMOs are, are looking around for how do I get a hand on this fast? And and you, you can look back at not all the schools, but surely some of the schools and say, they're not evolving at the same speed as the marketplace at all. And, and your class is kind of an example of how come it takes you to do this class? How come there's not millions of classes like this being developed around 
all the new data and technology all over the place. Yeah, there should be. I really, I, I think that there should be a course like this that is being taught at, at many, many more universities than just Emory University and soon to be University of Maryland when I, when I move there. <laughs> um, so, yes, I think it's, uh, it's been slow to change. And I, I do think that there is an element that uh, you know, business schools, you know, course curriculum, it's, it's been slow to, it, it is, it tends to be slow to evolve. You know, there's a lot of material that we teach that um, it, it's very over-indexed towards CPG. And, um, and it's not that CPG isn't very important. It's tremendously important, but, you know, other things have become important too. <laughs> and so, yeah, if we want to cater to all of these other new you know, kind of growth vectors of our economy. Like we, we just, we, we need to have courses that teach concepts that are more relevant to the, to those jobs. Um, Look, so we just did a show about believers and non-believers with McKinsey and the ANA. And what they said is one of the biggest problems here is business schools are not keeping up on the marketing front. Mm -hmm. And, and why, I mean, I, I hear, I agree with what you're saying because having hired some folks out of, of a B schools and, and looking at it also my producer and I've been talking to, to trying to talk to some of the colleges here just to, to help. And the, the re reception on new stuff doesn't appear to be that great. Why? Yeah. It's a, it's a slow moving machine. You know, I'd say that, uh, you know, creating a, and now I know this firsthand creating a course, it, it takes a lot of time and effort and pain. And uh, it's a, it's a real labor of love. And you know, especially for a junior faculty, you know, our incentive is, especially you know, us on the research track, you know, the the first priority is to publish top quality research. Yeah, you know, that's kind of the, the first priority. Um, so you you want to you want to be reasonably good in the classroom, but it's certainly lower on the priority list when it comes to what is it that's going to get me tenure, and so you know, people respond to incentives. And if yeah. you're a rookie professor, then you say, well, yeah, I've only got 24 hours in the day. Um, am I going to spend all that extra time on the teaching or am I going to spend it on, you know, on my research? And right. So, and do you get credit when you, like, when you, you create this new class, I, I would assume all kinds of other B schools are like, how can I get this class for me um, or my school? And like, we want to make classes like this. Is that happening or not? Yeah, I've had a, a number of first I've you get guest lecturing and uh, multiple other um, guest lecturing from multiple other universities, and uh, you know, I have this like CLV case study uh, blue Ap on Blue Apron that uh, it's been used uh, all over the place. Uh, so you know, it's this case that was co-written with Eric Schwartz. Um, but yeah, typically. To make a wholesale pivot towards CLV, like my course is now going to be on CLV. That that typically, I mean, again, that's a pretty heavy lift. Yeah, um, super heavy. But you know what I've I've seen a lot of people do is uh, a lot of professors have asked me for CLV slides, and so they'll want you know that one or two lectures that are here's like this quick hit on CLV. You know, just give me the crash course and a couple lectures, and so. Um, so it's kind of like a condensed version of some of a but, subset. But making of some traction into there, and, and hopefully a lot more things will make traction. Hey, Dan, can we talk about whether it's Blue Apron or or anything else? An example of CLV in practice, like a case study, if if you can share it, um, and also particularly where the case study showed a different outcome than the pure financials you were just looking at you know, the income and the balance sheet, whatever you want to say. So, yeah, I could, uh, so Blue Apron and Wayfair, are probably the two examples that I'm the most famous or infamous for. <laughs> All right, I'm going to um, go with famous, Dan, famous. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd say the most recent fun one was Warby Parker. So I don't know if you have a preference for, for one you or the You tell other. me what you think is the most fun, interesting one, and we'll go with that. I'll go with Warby Parker just because it's, right. it's newer. Um, and, you know, Again, Wait, let me put on my glasses for the Warby Parker thing. Okay. <laughs> I've got my Warby Parker glasses at home. So first off, just wanted to say I, I love the company. Yeah, obviously, Wharton grown, um, but uh, yeah, their example of a direct-to-consumer, you know, digitally native vertical brand. 
And um, in some sense, they were kind of one of the progenitors of, of that category. Um, and I'm a, I'm a big fan, you know, but uh, you know, we, we had run the numbers on them before they went public and uh, they, to their credit, they put a lot of really good disclosures in their, in their prospectus. Uh, so we, we ate it all up. Um, but there's just a whole, uh, a whole slew of interesting things that kind of came out of that, like lessons learned. And I think generalizable, uh, things that are, are more broadly applicable than just Warby Parker. Um, for one, that was an example where uh, we did find a pretty significant discrepancy between the valuation that we thought was fair and where they ended up trading. So, uh, you know, we ran this model again. The the unit economics were good. You know, we were inferring very healthy LTV to CAC. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, better better than the average company within the the set of companies that we've run analyses on at Theta. So, you know, better than average, but that doesn't mean uh, that any price is fair. So for That's one- true. And CAC is customer acquisition costs for everybody. Yes, sorry. Right, no, no. no worries. And LTV is lifetime value just for yeah. those who do. Um, so, yeah, so for one, you're, having good unit economics does not mean having a good valuation. You know, valuation is a function of price. And at some price, even a company with astoundingly good unit economics will be overvalued. So, and you're talking stock price here now, right? Stock price. Yeah. yeah. So what you're saying is, even though this was a killer company and it looked like it was doing great, you could not get to the stock price valuation. We were reaching. No matter what you did to the model based on all the data you had, right? Yeah, we reached as far as we could. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line on the, the customers, you buy that first pair of glasses uh, you know, the average amount that you spend on, it's about 180 bucks. And uh, what they showed in their filings is that after that, you know, if you take a thousand people that buy that first pair of glasses, about one fourth of them will buy within the next year, a fourth will buy the year after, a fourth will buy the year after, and a fourth will buy the year after. And so there's this question then of, well, you know, I'm sensing a trend here, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's going to go out some more years than that. But the question is, well, how many years? And um, and we said, you know what? Screw it. We're going to go out infinite years. <laughs> we'll just say these people are going to 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 you know one fourth of the cohort is just going to keep on going until the world to ends. Be a thousand. Yeah, yeah, until until we're all gone. And um, and and let's see what valuation that su suggests. And we still couldn't get to the, <laughs> to the market valuation. So um, yeah, so you know, it's it's one of those circumstances where. We like the company. We're rooting for them. Good unit economics. We really played that up. But you know, we said, you know, I just we you're can't not get buying there. the stock. But and we're not, not getting there by like a factor of two. You know, yeah. so it's not like well, you know, fifty versus forty. It's like fifty versus twenty. <laughs> no, wait, wait. So now this model, you can't even apply it to something like Reddit, can you? Because you know, Reddit just came out and it's, it hasn't made any money for nineteen years, and its stock price goes boom on day one. I, how does this model apply to something like that, or and can it even? Uh, well, in theory, you could. Um, yeah. Yes, actually, I was just talking about this yesterday in a guest lecture, ironically, <laughs> um, as part of a class where they wanted the CLB stuff. Uh, you have one model for engagement, and then the question is how much monetization you get per unit of engagement, and that's I think yeah. the the that's the difficult factor. Um, yeah, I'd say the other difficult factor is. You know, a lot of people talk about um, you know, upside to the valuation because of the data that's created being fed into LLMs, you know, who can be buyers of that data. Yeah. And um, That's yeah. large language model, I think. Yeah, so, sorry. I'm just going with all that's the- That's all right. I'm here to help. Without explanations. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, and so what, what price do you put on that? You know, yeah. So you've got the advertisers, you've got large language model companies like OpenAI. Um, so, yeah, I think traditionally, and this is kind of consistent with their disclosures, they'll often provide measures like monthly active users, daily active users to help you get a sense of you know, how much audience engagement there is. Uh, but, you know, there's just kind of that big question mark of how much money is the company going to get? And I think, you know, sometimes there can be more uncertainty in the ability to, you know, in that modernization model. So, so that's probably how I'd go about it. But, um, yeah, I just think that I'd have a much wider 
prediction interval for the stock price. You just yes. wouldn't be quite as confident in that in that monetization. <laughs> so well put, Dan. Hey, so um, you know, given all this empirical data, because if you look at at CLV, you look at, at at some of the other data that are available around marketing, where you can you can pretty much say a well-run marketing company or with marketing in its center is is on in general going to be better than a company that doesn't have marketing in a like business. How come there are still so many non-believers about all this stuff out there where they still want to just put marketing as a cost line versus a growth item? Yeah, I think it's in part um, language issues that I think marketing often tends to speak in one language, you know, how they think about success and value creation. And you know, I think oftentimes the, the finance department or the CFO, you know, they, they're they used to different language. You know, they, they think in, in terms of net present value and project finance. And, um, and so, you know, when they see engagement measures and things like that, I think being able to kind of go from that to uh, this was the amount of value that was created or, you know, just some sort right. of a proxy for that. I think that, that they need some help kind of getting there, you know? And so, you know, we'll, we'll often, I'm not sure that there's any like magic bullet to solve that communication issue, but yeah, I'd say that a, a step in the right direction can be this customer lifetime value type of concept. Cause it, at least for one first, all the historical measures, they can directly tie to revenue and profit. And that's a good thing. Um, the second thing is, you know, you're, you're talking investments again, except the investment here is the customer and you have the marginal costs of the customer to bring them in. And then you have the, the marginal benefit that you get in net present value terms after acquisition. So, you know, suddenly the CFO kind of hears all that. It's like, yeah, you know, that, that's language I'm familiar with. Um, now it's not language that, I think some marketers are terribly comfortable with. But they should get comfortable with it because but, well, we yeah. have a number of shows on why marketers should not use marketing jargon or try and convince everybody that they should become really great at brand awareness and consideration and everything else. It's because none of the investors actually eat any of those measures. They eat the financial measures. Mm -hmm. And and I do think marketers are... are partially responsible for being misunderstood because they're talking a language that requires huge translation instead of translating on the front end. I want to talk about how, how do you get marketers better at this? I mean, we already talked about business schools responsibility here to maybe step up their game and mm -hmm. evolve a lot on, on, on helping marketers think and approach things differently. But how about when marketers are setting their objectives or their, plans or communicating to their companies other than learning to speak finance what what advice would you give them uh start disclosing start disclosing relevant measures to it and disclose them to stakeholders where they'll care about the numbers and i think uh i think what what that can inevitably create is accountability you know that suddenly you're like, whoa, oh. <laughs> yeah, if those numbers are kind of moving in the wrong direction, now you need to explain what might be going on. And uh, and I'd argue that's a step in the right direction. It's just, you know, creating that accountability mechanism for yourself, you know, to other adjacent organizations within the, the company that um, you know, allow that dialogue to start taking place. And you know, it allows you to start speaking the language and speak, thinking through like, you know, what is the relationship between the stuff that I'm doing in terms of brand awareness and how that's manifesting in uh, these outcome measures that everyone cares more about, you know? Um, yeah. So, and I'd start with the backward looking measures first. You know, so first, just the no predictive model, just give me all of the, you know, the active customers acquired, retention measures, monetization measures, you know, the sort of ingredients that, you kind of put them together and you project them and that gets you to measures of lifetime value. But uh, because they're purely historic in nature, uh, there's no second guessing the marketer about the model that was used. You know, it's like, these are just auditable facts. 
And uh, uh, and, and the sales and profits that stick with them, depending on what you want to move around for CAC or anything else, those are auditable facts as well. So yeah, so I think starting with that's helpful because no one's going to be like, ah, that's, that's BS. You know, I'm, I'm sure this is just based on some crazy model. <laughs> um, yeah, no, this is just the actual raw data. Um, and I think once everyone starts getting comfortable with that, that also helps build the uh, the proficiency to be able to start thinking about the forward looking. Yes, it really kind of motivates those measures, um, but it allows you to take a more gradual approach and kind of work the company into it as opposed to you know, trying to, to sprint from day one. And can, can I flip this over to comp a little bit, compensation? Because a lot of marketing departments, they will pay for like actual marketing measures like brand awareness or acquis CAC, acquisition cost, you know, other stuff like that. Um, and some of these things, they probably have some impact on, or pay for traffic. They, they probably have some impact on CLTV, but looked at individually, they may or may not work. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of just tell us a little bit about how you might compensate a marketing department given all the uh, different functions that could sit in there? Yeah, it's hard. I think of uh, executive compensation, having that being based in part on measures of customer value. Yeah, there, I think you're on very solid ground. Um, yeah. When you move to the market department, I think it, it still merits a place on the, the compensation sheet, you know, that it's kind of one component of, of, you know, of what triggers payment. Because again, that's typically, while I'll say this elevates the role of marketing is because you know, it's the marketers who traditionally are managing the customer relationships and they're traditionally the owners of CLV. Well, if you're the owner of CLV, then you're accountable for CLV. <laughs> so, yeah, and CLV is uh, translating <laughs> to sales and profit uh, kind of immediately. Yeah, so it needs to be there. Um, but I'm also the first to say, imagine that you're the performance marketer and you're only focused, you're in the customer acquisition department. Well, um, you know, the repeat purchases a year later, you end up with these situations where you're like, well, that's not my, I wasn't involved with that, you know? Um, right. And it's, you know, yes or no. You know, oftentimes you want to be bringing in the right quality customers. And so that definitely is important. So again, it, it deserves a place, but um, they'll say, you know, I, I passed my ball off to the retention person and now yeah. it's their responsibility. So um, so if, if they drop the ball, are you saying that I'm going to not get paid? And so then they start getting upset. Um so, yeah, so, yeah, I'd say that, that there are certain measures that I think might be more aligned with the specific role of the people, you know, in question. Like if you're a customer acquisition person, um, you know, I think that the weightings of the different, um, you know, decomposed customer behaviors might be different from you if, if you're the retention marketer. Uh, but, yeah, certainly CLV deserves a place on all of their compensation sheets and, um yeah, it's just kind of how you kind of determine the weights for some of the other, uh, some of the other parts of it. I, I agree with this, and I, but I, I think one of the things to me is the company has to win the game, and if you had a great game, you can't just blame the defense or the offense for not doing their job. You have to collectively win the game, and the the real game is is in the financials. That's um, why, yeah. I mean, you you hire a sales manager, and they get paid in part based on restricted stock units. And that's, yeah. you know, for public companies, that's a function of the stock price. <laughs> and so, you exactly. know, you're very out of control of that. Um, but no one, you know, disagrees with that. You know, we all win together. We all lose together. So I think the same idea should apply to, to CLV. And in fact, it should apply, at least that's even closer to what they do than arguably the RSUs might be. They, yeah. they may argue that. <clears throat> it, we're closing in on, on, on time. And I, if you have another case study you want to share, that that'd be great. If not, I will go to the last question. Um, I'm trying to think the best. Well, maybe if, if you wanted to hear the aftermath of the Warby Parker story, I would love to hear the aftermath of the Warby. And there's kind of interesting. This is interesting. Other question that I think deserves a a place in the conversation, which is that of information disclosure. So maybe a little on the one, a little on the other. Um, yeah, so we, we came out saying you know, fair fair value is something like $22 a share. They started trading at 53. You know, we're getting all these calls of, you're an idiot. You know, yeah. <laughs> you didn't value the 
the growth options through the contact lenses and, and all that. Um, but then promptly just within a few months, you know, they just plummeted back down to earth and, uh, and then fell to our price and fell below our price actually. Uh, so we went back in and, and revisited the analysis and we found that the, you know, the fundamentals were relatively consistent with what we had inferred previously. Uh, so now we're, we're relatively constructive on the valuation. So whereas before, you know, we were, you know, slightly um, bearish on the stock price. Now I'd say, um, you know, we're slightly bullish, uh, but it's it's within the fairway, you know. Um, and I'd say that just the other aspect, this goes back to one of the issues that you inevitably start running into with CLV is conflict of interest problems. And um, the big conflict of interest problem when you're a public company is you don't want to make your, no one wants their baby to look bad, you know. And for companies, they want their CLV to look as good as possible and they want their right. CACs to be as low as possible. And so you have all these issues of, and I think this has held back the credibility of CLV uh, you know, to a large extent, is these companies, they start removing all of these costs, um, taking out the discount rate. Uh, they'll look to CAC and they define it in these very weird ways. And in the smallest possible way. Oh. And Warby Parker, I, I would say um, there was a, some issues with sloppiness in their disclosures that we called out and they actually had to restate their prospectus because of the issues that we pointed out. Um, but they also were pretty aggressive on some of the definitions. And um, and again, because there's no uh, there's no generally accepted accounting principles for how, how any of these measures should be defined, it's not like they're wrong. In, in the sense that um, they could be sued. You know, I'd say that none of these measures have any industry standard definition. So so I think we, we need to work towards that because I think it's going to help build the credibility of these measures for the next Warby Parker. Um, there you go. And, Here's a new class for you, Dan. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, last question. It's two-parter. You, you, you can take both parts but you have to take at least one practical advice for our audience. We haven't discussed yet and, or funniest story you can share on the air, pick one or both. Uh, funniest story in what category? Anything you want. Anything I want. Well, I'd say going back to the Wayfair example, that was truly surreal. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we put out this analysis on Wayfair bearish, and um, yeah. and in that case, yeah, imagine you're this pipsqueak third year PhD student. You're there just trying to get a a marketing publication, you know, to to, to make this pivot to marketing. Um, we posted the paper, and the very next day, this famous short seller started to tweet about it, saying it was the best, smartest piece of work they'd ever seen on Wayfair, and the stock price fell ten percent in a single day. Yeah. Uh, and I think it was like the, the biggest stock price decline in over a year and a half um, and just continued to tumble. And then it was featured on on Jim Cramer's Mad Money. And you know, we started getting all these angry, angry phone calls from <laughs> sell side equity research researchers. Um, but, yeah, I just I still remember the, this this surreal. It, I mean, in retrospect, it was hilarious <laughs> just uh, having to go through that as a, as a student, you know, just trying to get an A. Um, you know, but you uh, did probably get an A on this paper. <laughs> that made the A. Yeah. 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 So that was kind of the funny thing was we uh we wrote this first version of it and it used this data set from uh this company that wanted to remain private. And we did this thought experiment, and the reviewers came back and they said, Look, you're telling me this is like a method for for cor corporate valuation for public companies. Give me public company data, you know? And so we, we hemmed and hawed, went back, found Wayfair. It was one of the first companies that we found that disclosed the right data, did up the analysis, and then that's what created Wayfair. But if the reviewers had said, you know, that first version was fine, yeah, Wayfair would, we wouldn't have, have any Wayfair. <laughs> I'm sure Wayfair is not sending you free products. Be, uh, <laughs> oh, oh. Anything else you want to share with our listeners before we sign off? Um, I would say, you know, as, as you can tell, I just, I get fired up about all this stuff. I, I love it. Um, you know, to the extent that your 
on your own CLV journey, uh, please don't be a stranger. You know, very happy to uh, to help share resources, slides, other materials, and um, yeah, just uh, help you along help you along the way. Well, Dan, I'll take my course. Yeah, it'll be a yeah, it'll be all the course, and <laughs> we'll we'll put up some links for you on on CMO Confidential's page if you want. Um, thank you, Dan, very much, and thanks to everyone for listening to CMO Confidential. If you are enjoying our show, hit the like button, share, and subscribe. And look for all of our shows on Spotify, Apple, the I Hear Everything Network, and YouTube, which include marketing, the battle between believers and non-believers, the Budweiser case, how not to manage a socio-political issue, what private equity really thinks about marketing, and is the CMO position the hardest job in business? Hey, all you marketers, stay safe out there. This is Mike Linton signing off for CMO Confidential.